Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Sue, and for all those who've organised this. It's uh, a privilege to be here and to, to see so many who have come along today. Um, just before I start, I want to acknowledge that the results that we're going to be talking about are part of a, a larger program, the Smart Irrigation for Profit program, uh, funded through the Rural R&D for Profit program, so the Australian Government, um, TIA, Dairy Australia, and um, the National Centre for Engineering and Agriculture that are part of that work. And so Joe and, and Alison are part of that work, uh, and David, um, as one of my project officers, has done most of the, the work on the ground, so we want to acknowledge them in, in the work that we're going to be talking about um, today. <coughs> To make sure I turn it on, yeah, that's not, that's it. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll have a bit of a look at three particular areas that we've been looking at within our project. One is associated with, with energy, then we'll look at irrigation scheduling and, and pasture growth rates, and then we'll finish off with some, um, some findings that we've had around variable rate irrigation. So they're the three areas that we want to think about today. There's certainly a lot more work that's been done within that project, but not enough time to be able to talk about it today. Um, <clears throat> okay. So the particular project that we're focusing on is is very much about um, irrigation efficiencies in pasture. So we'll the context of what we're doing is going to be related to pasture, but a lot of the the detail would um, also be relevant to other um, situations. And this particular project involves five sites that have been set up across the north and northwest of of Tasmania. Four of those sites are focused on uh, human interaction in terms of making decisions around what needs to happen. One of those sites has been set up for autonomous um, activities and, and Alison will be talking about that a little bit later on. <coughs> so what we've done for each of these sites is, and these are all under pivot, is we've gone out to these sites and we've set up a whole heap of uh, sensor um, technology to be able to, to monitor water use, to, to be able to monitor energy use, um, weather, the soil moisture, um, and, and so we've, we've managed to bring all of that together and then we've been, been able to display that so that we can keep an eye on all of the different factors that are going on on these sites. So there's a whole heap of um, uh, sensor gear that's out there on those sites to be able to understand what's going on. <coughs> so just thinking about some of the results then in the first year of the project around energy, um, essentially we, we know that obviously to, to shift water, that requires a lot of energy. If we think about it, um, water is very heavy. Um, if we think about the details that are here, um, a litre is a kilogram, a thousand litres is a tonne. If we look at uh, a megalitre of water on a hectare, that's the same as about 100 millimetres of rainfall, and every megalitre per hectare is a thousand tonnes per hectare. So there's a lot of weight that has to be lifted to be able to apply that water, and so it's going to cost money. So energy is involved in a, in a major way, and so any way that we can um, make that more efficient is certainly going to save um, money for the farmers. <coughs> on, on those five sites in the first year, uh, we measured energy use for pumping, and if we look at those five sites, <coughs> what you'll notice is that in particular one of those sites was using a lot of energy, a lot of kilowatt hours per megalitre, so 787 which came out at about $181 per megalitre, which is a long way above what would be considered um, uh, within the benchmark for, for the cost of, of applying water. And so we asked ourselves a question, what's going on on this particular site? So in that first year, we just put the gear on and measured and we didn't have any interaction with the farmers. We wanted to know what was going on. And so we just measured it. And so we looked at it at the end and we said, what's going on here on this particular site? And, and when we assessed it, what had happened on that particular site is that there was a pump um, and motor set set up to be able to run a hard hose. There then had been a, um, a pivot put in and under that pivot um, they continued to use the same pump set but they put a pressure reducer to bring the pressure down to a, a level that was suitable for the pivot and, and they continued to operate. So we were putting a lot of pressure in the system then we're bringing that pressure back down. So it was costing money to be able to shift the water at a higher pressure and then we had to reduce that back down. So we, we having examined that, got James Curran from Macquarie Franklin to come in and do an assessment to give us um, a, a recommendation on what would be a suitable pump for that system. So we, we had a look at that and when we um, compared the 
the, the situation that was currently being used with what we could potentially achieve, we, we figured we could go from 787 kilowatt hours down to 266 kilowatt hours, which would be a savings of $120 per meg or about $20,000 for the season for that particular pivot. So we, we got the farmer to put the new pump and motor system in, and then we measured the, the energy. And so what we've got here, obviously, is the amount of energy being used with a bigger pump set. We got them to trim the impeller for that pump set, so we were able to save quite a bit for the use of that pump set for the hard hose. But here is the new pump and the power that is being drawn for the, the pivot. And so very clearly what we've been able to demonstrate is that we've been able to save a whole heap of money for that farmer so that their payback is probably half a year. Uh, so it cost about nine or $10,000 for the new pump and it was costing him $20,000 a year anyway, um, excessive above what he should have been. So certainly that's an example of a way in which you can just monitor and save a lot of money in, in that particular situation. Now we've got other examples of where money can be saved but there's no time to be able to, to talk through that. But certainly it pays to, to think about the situation that you have and to match the pump set with the, with the pivot or with whatever that irrigation system is. A practice change in the system requires a re-evaluation of the pump design and that was the issue that we faced on that particular site. But also maintenance of existing systems can make a difference and we need to think about that with regard to power use. Let's move on to irrigation scheduling because that certainly is an area that over the last two years we've, we've noticed um, no, is, is really an issue with regard to irrigation, particularly under pivots. Getting scheduling right can make a massive difference to productivity, to the efficiency of that system. So thinking about irrigation scheduling, let's just try and understand what are the most important things that we need to, to be aware of to be able to get good irrigation scheduling. Firstly, we need to know the readily available water. And then we need to know the evapotranspiration, the amount of water that is going out of the system, and we need to know the system capacity of our irrigation, how much water we can put back into the system. So how much water is there in the bucket, the readily available water for the plants to grow, how much water is going out of the system, how much water is going into the system. And soil moisture probes are a useful way to visualise what's actually happening in that bucket of water that the plants are trying to, to grow from. So they're the, th they're the three main things we need to really think about. So if we... <clears throat> If we think about readily available water, now we look at this diagram here and I think most people are familiar with it. This is a situation in which we have saturated soil, here we have dry soil. Apologies, I've gone backwards. Um, what we're wanting to do is we don't want our situation to be too wet, we certainly don't want it to be too dry because the plants have to work too hard to draw that water out. We want our water to be in a zone between our field capacity and our refill point, the readily available water zone. And the way that we calculate that is we look at the root depth, we look at the type of soil that we've got there and how much water that soil can hold and we do a calculation. And so for our pastures, um, we, we have somewhere between 9 and 27 millimetres of water that is available in the top 30 centimetres for that pasture to grow. And so if we think of the bucket um, and we think of, say, a ferrosol soil, about 24 millimetres of water would be what is available for that plant to grow with, within that 30 centimetres of, of depth. Now, if we go to think about evapotranspiration, so that's how much water we need, about 24 millimetres to be able to grow. Let's have a look at how much is going out of the system. So in terms of evapotranspiration, and this is some examples from Deloraine um, back in 2015-16, we, we go from very little evapotranspiration in winter right up to about six, six and a half millimetres per day in January and then it drops away again. So our maximum is about six to six and a half millimetres a day that is being taken out of the system. The other thing we need to think about is system capacity. The system capacity is the maximum possible rate at which the machine can apply water to the irrigated field area. And so what we need to remember is that this is the maximum amount that can be applied in millimetres per day. So what that system has been designed to be able to, to do in a 24 hour period. Now, if we think about those three things, let's look at a, a scenario. Say, for instance, we've got a readily available water of 24 millimetres. We have um, evapotranspiration of about six and a half millimetres per day, so this is in January. Uh, we've got a design system capacity of our pivot uh, of 6.5 millimetres per day. And, that we're, and, and in this situation, we're going to irrigate one day 
in three. So every third day we're going to turn that irrigator on and we're going to irrigate. The depth that's going to be applied is going to be 6.5 millimetres every third day because that's what that system can, can, can do in terms of its system capacity. That would mean we have a managed system capacity of 2.17 millimetres per day. So that's 6.5 millimetres divided by three. Okay, so we only end up putting 2.17 millimetres per day on. If we thought about that scenario, we've got a situation in which we've had a rain event, the, the bucket is full, we have two days in which we have water being drained out of the system at 6.5 mils a day. On that third day, we put 6.5 mils in, but we also have 6.5 mils going out. And then we stop for two days and we have another drawdown of water and then we put 6.5 mils in. We stop on the third day, we put 6.5 mils of uh, we, we, we stop, we draw it down, and then we put 6.5 mils in. What you'll notice is very quickly, within you know, six days, we're getting to the point where the amount of available water is dropping below that refill point. And so the plants are going to start to stress. And so by the time we get down here, there isn't water that's available easily for those plants to grow. Now, if we get to that point and we suddenly say, oh, this place is getting too dry, I need to irrigate, you turn that irrigator on, and if there's no rain, you'll be putting water into the system, but you're not getting the available water back up into that readily available water zone. And that's the issue we've seen with a lot of our sites, in particularly not this last year, but the year before, but even this last year. When it comes to doing a water balance, so often we get to a point where we think, oh, it's a bit dry, we better turn it on, but we're only putting 6.5 mils in, because that's all we can, and we're getting 6.5 mils out. So we've got an issue. It's very, very hard to catch up again. Let's, having looked at that theory, let's have a look at some of the results of some of our sites from 2015-16 from in terms of irrigation scheduling and pasture production. If we go down to our Cressy site, um, in that particular year, Cressy was averaging about 30 to 40 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day in pasture production under the pivot. Uh, a little bit further away at Montana, they were averaging about 50 to 60 kilos of dry matter per hectare in the same period of time. On this particular site, they only used about four and a half megalitres of water through that season. Cressy used about 6, 6.2, 6.3 megalitres of water. So this site used more water and yet grew worse pasture. What's going on on that particular site? Now, the farmers looked at that and said, righto, I've got an opportunity loss of about 20 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day. I should have been growing more. Uh, on that site. I had to go and purchase a whole heap of um, grain to be able to replace what I could have grown in pasture. I'm costing myself about 40 odd thousand extra just in terms of what I had to do to replace what I could have grown. So he says, what, what's going on here? So we had a look at the particular system and we did a water budget. So here is a water budget for February, so the month of February. We had a big rain at the end of January, so we were full. We then have our uh, water being taken out through evapotranspiration and we irrigated each of these red bars here. So water's going back into the system, it's then going out of the system, it's coming back in, it's going out, coming in, out, in, out, in, out. What do we see happening here? Very quickly, we have dropped below what we call our readily available water zone, which sits about uh, this area here. So that's our readily available water zone, about 24 down from there up. So very quickly we've dropped below that zone and we're putting a whole heap of water in here, but that water isn't being used effectively. So essentially what we see happening is that we're getting what we call the green drought situation. Using water, putting into the system, when we're already at a deficit and the plants stay green but they don't grow. Why? Because they don't have the ability to be able to draw that water out efficiently. And so we've seen that again and again, not just on this site but on other sites. So if you look at the average ETA on that site for that month, it was 4.9 millimetres. The design system capacity was 6.3 millimetres per day. The managed capacity was only 1.8 through that month. So only 1.8 mils was going in and 4.9 mils was going out. So immediately you look at that and you can say, wow, we've got a problem here. And even with the water that we're putting in here, we're not using it efficiently. And so there's a real problem with, with this system. In fact, during that month, you needed to irrigate five and a half days out of seven to be able to replace what is being taken out of that system. So you basically need that pivot going all the time, really. Um, this is some of the soil moisture probe data that we've got here and what we can see here, this is over time, we have the soil moisture, so here the, the profile's fairly full up here and it's drying out here and so you can certainly see for that site that we were getting a lot of drying and you can certainly see the way that these um, graphs are going that we're getting a lot of stress here on our plants in the way that water is drawing out. So that's just evidence in the ground that what we're saying is happening is happening. We're getting a lot of water drawn out of that system and we're not refilling the profile again either as we, as we water. 
Having a look at this current year, on this particular site in this current year, so the, last, the year that's just finished, we, we came into the season where we were producing about 80 kilos of dry matter per hectare. That's very different to the 40 of last year. But very quickly we had this big drop right down to about 30 kilos. We then had it back, brought back up to about 80 kilos and then we had another drop down here and then we had the, the drop off at the end of the season. What's going on here? We've got the potential to be able to produce our pasture right up here. Well, we've got these big holes. What's going on on this particular site? This is the second year of the project, having already looked at, at um, what happened in the first year. Well, if we, if we have a look at the soil moisture probes for this particular site, you'll notice we came into the season quite wet, but then we reached the point where, say, the end of November, we started to dry off. There wasn't irrigation going on here um, very much. We dried right down here below what we consider our refill point and then we started to water up but we weren't filling the profile again and we're staying very dry. So there was a real issue here. So we can certainly see that where we get the drop off in pasture productivity reflected in our soil moisture probes, we've got a real issue here. Um, if we look a little bit further over, we were getting it right here. So we were watering in between our, our, our refill point and our, um, and our fill capacity. And then we got to a point where it looks as though we were putting too much on. We were staying right above field capacity, so perhaps we were getting too wet and, and, and over-irrigating. And if you think about it uh, and look at these results, they line up with this big drop here and with this particular drop here. So if we just go across to the, the next slide here. If we, if we zone in on, on the period of February, uh, of February where we, or January where we had excess water, we had everything going okay here in terms of the readily available water. We then had a rain event which filled it right up. We then kept irrigating through this period. Then we had a second rain event which is this one here. And then you'll see that the water's going right through the system and it's going right down below the, the root zone and being lost to the system. And everything is far too wet. So we've actually gone from too dry to a situation in which we're putting too much water on and we're getting too wet. If we quickly just have a look at some of the results at the Montana site. So at our Montana site, we were doing really well as we came into the season, about 80 kilos of dry matter, 60 to 80 kilos of dry matter per hectare. And then we had this big drop off here. We turned around and started to produce OK, and then we had another drop off. What's going on here? Because we know on this site that we should be able to get right up here, right through the season. So again, let's have a look at the um, soil moisture. What do we see? We see a very clear dry down during that period, and then a second dry down here and a reasonable period of irrigation there. What we're seeing in the bucket is reflecting very clearly what is happening to the pasture. If we don't get it right, then we're going to have major productivity issues. Now, the, the simple situation here was that there was issues with the pivot and with the suction and with the pump, and so there was a whole heap of playing around with it. We couldn't get the scheduling to go properly, and so therefore we had an issue with um, pasture production. We got that all fixed. The farmer then handed over the... the the actual management of it to someone else, that person didn't manage it correctly and the whole lot dried out again. You can see the impact of that on pasture productivity. So in summary, what we've got to think about is that when we're scheduling irrigation, we've got to be aware of the green drought. We've got to make sure that we're putting it in to keep it between our refill point and, and our field capacity. Because we can then put water in if we're not at that point, if we're deficient, and waste that water completely in terms of the efficient use of it. We've got to be careful that we don't overwater, so we've got to respond to the season. So we've got to keep an eye on the, the ET and on the rainfall forecasts and so forth so that we don't end up in a situation where we're not utilising that water that's there or that's coming. And poor watering costs production and money. That's really the lesson that I've seen over two years consistently. I've just given two examples. There's a whole heap of examples of how that is being done uh, wrong for various reasons. <coughs> right, we'll just quickly move on, if I can. And quickly just have a look at variable rate irrigation. Um, why do we want to be able to variably irrigate or we'll use variable rate irrigation? Well, there's a couple of reasons why we might want to do that. One of those is to, to manage variability um, due to management decisions. And so when we think of our management, we, we may set up a pivot and we may have laneways, we may have um, paddocks that we want to cut for silage, we may have... Um, no, um, paddocks that we want to just re sow. So the, the need to be able to apply water at different rates to those particular paddocks is a management decision. Uh, we don't want to put water on roadways and so variable rate irrigation is really good to be able to turn water off in areas that we don't want it. 
that's a, that's a management decision. But the other reason that we could use variable rate irrigation is to be able to, to handle variability in either the climate and how, as that changes, or in terms of the particularly the soils and the topography on that particular site. So I want to think about this, this issue down here um, in, in a little bit more detail. If we can get this to work. Um, in terms of soils and topography, how do we measure the variability that exists under our pivot in terms of our soils and therefore in terms of the amount of readily available water so that we can utilise that? There's a number of ways that we can go into a, a paddock to try and understand variability because that's really key to getting our variable rate irrigation right. One of those may be to take or, or to do an EM38 survey, for instance. We take an EM38 survey, uh, sled out there, we do a measurement, um, produce a map of the electrical conductivity of the soil, which gives us a bit of an idea of the different types of soil, the amount of clay that's there, so a sand versus a clay, for instance. And we can get a map that shows the different areas that may potentially respond differently to moisture. The other way we can look at variability is to look at a, what we call a landscape change map, so the change in the slope of that site. And that can have an impact on the, the way in which water flows and the way in which um, we might need to irrigate on that particular site. Now, if we look at these two maps, this one's an EM map, this is a landscape change map, and we, what we've done is we've put two soil moisture probes in here, at one site one and site two, and here is the results of that soil moisture data. If you look at a rain event, everything's wetted up. Very quickly in uh, probe one, it dries down and wets up and dries down. At probe two, when that rain event occurred, it stayed very wet, so very different in the way they're responding to that water. If we look at this map here, both of those come in in an area that's fairly similar in terms of the variability that's displayed from the EM map. Whereas this map down here, which identifies a lot of the ridges really well because of the change in slope and the base of those ridges, we can see that it's quite different. So if you think about it, this landscape change map better reflects the variability on the site than this particular map up here. So the message that I'm probably wanting you to get is, when it comes to measuring variability, don't just go out there and assume that by putting an EM38 map, I'm getting a good measure of that variability and then <coughs> use that information to put into the pivot to determine how you're going to water. You've got to really understand what that variability is and there's more than one way to do it. And so in this situation, the landscape change map is certainly the one that we needed to, to describe the variability of that particular pivot. Now, we went and put a, a group of wells help from AgLogic to put together a, a VRI map and we put that into the pivot and we show that we could get a 29% reduction in, in irrigation water as a result of the use of that, that um, zone map. So the blue areas would have had 100%, these areas just on the edges would have had zero and the green areas would have had uh, somewhere in the middle. And so we were saving 1.4 megs per hectare or 70 megalitres of water uh, across the season. Here's another example at Cressy where we used a combination of EM38 map um, landscape change and the farmer's input to draw that map and once we put that map into the system we were able to save 34% from uh, compared with flat rate and that's about two megalitres per hectare on that particular site. So certainly there's, there's potential to save a lot of water on those particular sites. But let's think about it. We've gone and taken a map, we've put that map into the pivot and we've allowed that then to determine how to apply the water variably to that site based on some measure of variability. One of the things we've got to understand though is that variability under that pivot changes over time. And this is something we've really got to think about. You can't just take a map, put it into the pivot and assume that that is going to be okay for the season. So if we look at this particular example here, if we look early in the season, you'll notice that here with this um, soil moisture probe we've got a situation in which this one's drying down quite readily early in the season, this one's staying quite wet. So there's a lot of difference in the way the water responds early in the season. So in relation to that, there is a reason to variably apply water. Less here or none here and more there. However, when we move on in the season, you will notice that the pattern of water use on those sites is very similar. So as the season progresses and we rectify the issue for which that variability exists, we're needing to apply less, uh, or well, we don't need the variable rate to be applied. Because ultimately what we're doing is, if we're correcting the situation, is we're then having to apply water to meet the, the amount of evapotranspiration that's going out of the system. So a really important message, it has to change over time. Now, time's starting to run out, so I'll just quickly... If we think about VRI payback, now, how... If we were to go and invest in, in VRI technology, it costs money, what sort of um, return on that investment or, or payback are we going to expect? If we were to think about it with regard to just saving water, so we've thought about a couple of examples where we've saved water. 
And on this pivot, a 55 hectare pivot, we put a number of assumptions in, capital cost of about 47,000. What we're showing is that if we just say, on the basis of the amount of water we're saved and the cost of applying that water, it's going to take us a long time to pay back that particular investment. If, however, we, we can get improved productivity from that site, not just savings of water, in this case one tonne of dry matter per hectare, very quickly we're paying that back in a much, much shorter period of time. We need to see that our VRI is leading to an improvement in productivity. If we look at a scenario where there's both, um, it's less than, than two years. So just moving on quickly. Can we expect with VRI technology that we can get improved production due to the, the, the technology that's there? Well, that depends on the reason for that variability, whether it be because of a lack of water or too much water or whether it be um, due to something else. If we think of some scenarios here, and this here is some, some yield maps from a couple of paddocks, um, and here's some examples of a situation in which, uh, if we look at this yield map, it's, a, it's called a heat map. The green is 100%, um, so really good productivity. The red is about 40% of the productivity of these green areas. If we look at uh, a yield map right at the beginning of the season in December versus a yield map uh, over in March, and we have a look at the way in which the yield changes, you'll notice in this area when there was plenty of moisture around, growing really well, by the end of the season this area is really poor. And this was under a pivot, so a, a standard pivot, and so it was watering the whole time through. So we've got a change from good production to poor production. In these two areas it's poor production, by the end of the season it's good production. So essentially what we're seeing is there's variability existing and that variability is changing over time. We, the way in which you can solve that is to have a variable rate irrigator. And, and we're seeing that not just on one paddock, we're seeing it on plenty of paddocks where we're doing our biomass um, yield. Uh, here's another paddock, if we have a look at it. Here's an area that was really wet, no grass was there, you're not going to get any growth at all. Here's an area that was slightly higher, it was growing well when it was wet at the beginning of the season, later in the season it's poor. On the other hand, here's an area that was poor early on, probably too much water, growing a lot better towards the end of the season. Again, evidence that if you had VRI you can probably solve those particular situations. Um, but variability could be due to other things as well, and here's an example of a situation in which there were um, issues with the fertiliser going on, so obviously VRI won't um, affect that. So in summary, we need to ground truth our fancy variability maps. They need to be uh, meaningful for the purpose. VRIs can save water, but VRI zone man management changes through the season um, are going to mean that we, we're going to need different VRI maps due to different parts of the season. VRI payback depends on growing more grass and VRI won't fix any issues that aren't related to water. Uh, I suppose they're the key messages that come out of it. So how are we going to be able to get this? That's where Alison comes in with the autonomous irrigation. So just to finish, take home messages. Don't assume your system is right. Checking it could save you a lot of money. Okay, you always need to check it. Getting irrigation scheduling wrong costs money in productivity significantly and VRA payback depends on growing more grass, so we have to see evidence for that uh, in terms of what we're doing on those sites. Um, I want to acknowledge those who were involved in this project and thank you very much. <laughs>